from the gospel, or if this were truly epic, Old Testament reading, I love that too. But today I'm going to preach from the call. The call is often the summation of the theme of all the readings. And it tells us what the readings are about. The call today. No mercy about the church, church, being gathered in unity to your church, gathered in unity. Proclaim, they show forth the power, your power amongst the peoples. That the church gathered in unity may show forth the power of God to all peoples. That's what we're talking about. The power of God. This last week, two weeks ago, I guess, came out the grand jury report. A devastating report, a shocking and horrific report from the state of Pennsylvania and all the dioceses gathered there and abuses that happened in the Catholic Church. It's a different denomination, it's a different state, but it's devastating to all of us. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I'm talking about over the last 70 years, 80 years, the abuses, the evil committed by clergy, and the cover-up and the washing it away, and the, the ignoring of it, and the setting it aside. They said of 300 priests being accused, 100 were from the area around Pittsburgh. Now, I find this heavy for several reasons. One, because I was raised mostly in the Catholic Church around Pittsburgh, as was my father and my grandparents and all my aunts and uncles. And so it feels very close to home. And this wasn't any church and any guys. These were my churches. My diocese. And also, as a clergy person, albeit a different denomination, that we are in the same river of life. We are the people of God. We are the ones ordained to proclaim the good news, not violent. And I've been thinking about this a lot over the last two weeks. And particularly, how can scandals be covered up? How can they be hidden? In part, I think it's because of our understanding of the church our understanding of the priesthood, in part because we look towards God as mystery, and God as other, and we don't know God, and so we come to church, then it's their business to know God a little bit more. I used to look up to my priest as a child, and thought, you know, he's not God, but maybe one step closer. It's certainly holier than me. And so we treat our priests with reverence and respect, which is right and good. But we, we treat them with respect and reverence, and we Surely, if they study God, they must be slightly closer. And it creates an atmosphere. It creates an atmosphere that becomes muddled and cloudy and dark. We look towards this giant institution where he says, trust us. Trust us. We're in charge. Don't ask too much. Don't shine your lights too much into our inner workings. And it gets repressed and pushed down. That's wrong. And I think ultimately what we have to do is understand the priesthood differently. What we have to do is understand what does it mean to be the very people of God. To understand that, we have to get into our time machines and go back in time. We've been writing in our time machines a lot lately. So one more time, we'll get back in our time machines. We're going to go back past the Enlightenment, past the Renaissance, past the Reformation, past the Romans, past the Greeks, past the pyramids. We're all the way back in time. But like around the time when the Egyptians are starting to scratch their head and thinking, you know what would be awesome? It's like right at that point where there are Egyptians, but they're not building things yet. When we get out of our time machines, and we find this guy named Abram wandering around. Abram was, didn't have a large family. As a matter of fact, he was married, but he's got an old man and kids. And he experiences God. And at first he doesn't believe God. But every time he kind of catches on. And he experiences God. God says, Abram. Listen, man, I choose you. I choose you to be my partner in crime. I choose you to live with and to love. And you choose me, and I will bless you. Let's promise each other that you will choose me, and I will choose you, and I will give you family, and I will give you children, and I will give you descendants like the stars of the sky. And all you have to do is be my royal priest. You have to be my royal priesthood. That you and your family and your children and all the descendants will be part of this royal priesthood of all the believers. That everyone who is born under your, under your banner, under your tent, under your name, they belong to me. And what does a priest do? A priest both blesses and makes things whole. And he said, I will bless you if you go everywhere you go. You will be a blessing to me. You will proclaim my power to all people. Everywhere you go, people will know me because of you. People will see what, how you live, will see how you act, will see how you create a community, and because of your life, 
they will know me God. So your job is to be my master, my emissary, my, my feet on the ground. Abraham, I will bless you if you proclaim my power. And so he says, okay. And he gets married. They have a child. They have two sons. Then they have one son who has a lot of sons, 12. The 12 become the 12 tribes of Israel. They're all cousins, right? And each tribe has one especially. Some people are farmers, and some people are metal workers, and some people are um, shepherds, lots of shepherds. But they're all part of this royal priesthood. They're all the tribes of Israel, in this nation that is the royal priesthood of God. And what is their job? It's to be a blessing to God, to be the ambassadors and the emissaries and the boots on the ground, the people of God, that everywhere they go, people see them say, I want that. I want to be like those people. I want to experience God that they worship. And their job was to proclaim the goodness of God through their life. <coughs> But among the twelve tribes, there was one tribe set specifically aside. The tribe of Levi. And they said, look, y'all are priests. We are the community of God. But you specifically, don't shepherd, don't farm. You just hang out around the tabernacle. You all hang out around the church. And help us come together as a community. Help us learn the ways of God. Help us follow God's law. Help us offer sacrifices when we make mistakes. Help us celebrate our victories. When God is good and we are abundant, help us to be the people that God has called. And so the Levites were set aside as the chief priests, as the high priests, as the priests among priests. And so we come back out of our time machine, we come back to today, and how do we understand ourselves as disciples, as apostles? We are the ambassadors, the emissaries. We are the ones who inherit the blessing that came from Abraham all the way to us. We are the royal priest. You are the royal priest of God. You are the one who are tasked with proclaiming the power of God on you. That's your job. Today as we finish our service, well, I'll say this right now. We look up at the altar, and on the altar, we call that green cloth, the tent. It is for us the tabernacle that Moses carried through the desert. Where God himself dwelt under that tent is the very nature of God. We say the host, the communion is the body and the blood of Christ. Where is God? God is here among us. God is most poignantly in our universe. And right now, where is God? God is here, residing with us. But in a moment, at the time of celebration, we take that into ourselves. We consume it. We eat it. We take it into our very souls. And we say that it's no longer there. At the end of the service, we take the tent away. That God is not on the altar, that God is in me, that God is in you. And we say in our final prayer, as we're about to walk through the doors, we're about to go back to work, back to family, back to chaos, we say, Lord, now that you have sanctified me, you've made me a holy receptacle. God is no longer in the temple of Israel, God is in me, you've made me holy. To carry your Holy Spirit within myself, we say, now set my feet on the ground. To use my mind, my words, my thoughts, and especially my actions to proclaim your power to all people. Now the Holy Spirit's me, so now the power is not in your Holy Spirit. To show people your love through my love. To show people your forgiveness through my forgiveness. To show people your mercy through my mercy. Let me be your emissary and your ambassador. This is the very nature of who we are as Christians. We pray, Lord, now send me out to you, good work given me to do. You are the royal priesthood of God. You are the ones who decide ministry. You are the ones who build ministry and create it. You are the ones who proclaim the power of God. And then we say, we should leave somebody back in the church to keep the lights on. Right? We all got to go to work. We all got to go back to our farms and back to our sheep. We got to go back to work. Let's leave somebody back behind. Somebody who's not good at anything else. And we'll make them our priests. Right? The chief priest among the priests, our friend Sally, our lifetime intern Sally, is going to be ordained a priest in under two years. We'll be here. Celebration and balance. And at that moment, as we as she's ordained, we're not saying, Sally, you've become something new. Oh my goodness, Sally, you are a terrible person, and now you're an amazing person. Oh my goodness, Sally, you are sinful and, and run. I shouldn't go too much with this. <laughs> 
And now you are so holy, and, and we are so proud to know we say, Sally, we as a community value you. We think you have things to teach us, things to preach to us. We think that Sally has gifts and skills that can help the church stay open. And she can help us from the inside while we're back at work. So we ordained her to be the chief priest among all the priests. And then when we fall, when we sin, and when we need to come back and repent to God, she's there. And the chief priest works to help us celebrate the good times of life, the baptisms and the births, and the celebration of marriage, and the hard times when we're sick, when we're in the hospital, and when people we love die. And the priest, in the body of, of God is, you know, we think Paul tells us we're all like the body. I think the priest is not the hands and the feet. You are the hands and the feet. You are the ones out there doing the work of God. The priest is maybe the heart, sometimes the mouth, but definitely the heart. The job is to pump those life-giving nutrients and blood to all the members of the body. But our job is to inspire you, excite you, motivate you to go out and do the work that God has set before. John McCain, Sister John McCain passed away yesterday. And what I love seeing all the treatments, or what I was getting annoyed with this morning looking through Twitter, I was getting annoyed by how many people began by saying, I totally disagree with this politics, but I respect this man. I was annoyed because it was over and over and over. And of course, his political allies were supporting him and loving him and celebrating his life, but it's everyone who disagreed with him that is still celebrating and honoring and respecting this man. And why do we celebrate John McCain? Now, John McCain, just so you know, he went to grade school at our seminary. There's this grade school at the Virginia Theological Seminary. So you know he's great he went to physical school. <laughs> his father and his grandfather were in the military to serve. When he was captured as a POW in Vietnam, they gave him an opportunity to end the torture, to end the suffering, to go home. He said, I'm not going to leave. My friends behind not He said, that's just not possible. They served a long career, an illustrious career, a profound career. And at this funeral service, presidents of two different parties are going to eulogize him because he's somebody who transcended party. That he stood up to his political foes, and he stood up to his political allies, not for convenience, but to do what was right. In his final message before John McCain passed away, he wrote a beautiful letter, a beautiful book, proclaiming, declaring, begging us to put aside the divisiveness of politics, to work together, said there is no other time but now to work with no other people but you, that we have to do this, that we have to work together, and we can't wait for someone else. We can't wait for the whole world to agree with me to act. We have to act right now for the betterment of everyone. And that's why we celebrate him, right? Because he was willing to be bold. He was willing to be courageous. He was willing to step up and do when everyone else would step back. And I think that's what we're called to do as Christians. As the people of St. Thomas, the wonder and the beauty of this church is it's a new church. We're 25 years old. We've never always done it this way. Right? It's not the way my grandparents did it, my great-grandparents did it. We are the ones who invented this church and created it. It's the people of this church who built the altar, who laid the tile on the floor. It's the people of this church who raised the money and made it come true so that we can gather as a community to celebrate our joys and we can sit together in our sorrows. We created this church. On September 9th, we're going to have a community meeting, a town hall meeting, where we're going to check in. At the beginning of the year, we have a meeting to talk about our vision for the year. We're going to check in and see how have we done. What, where have we grown? Where have we achieved? What are we still lacking? And we're going to talk about our Catholic campaign. We have a vision, we have plans to expand the church. We have a vision plans to build a building just outside the windows here for education and outreach and mission and fellowship and hospitality. And look, folks, my whole life I've sat in other people's churches, churches that other folks have built with their time and their energy and their money. And now is our chance to do it. Now it's our chance to step up and say, we want more space, or not. It's not like it's a building for design. It just creates more work for me, right? It'd be great if y'all said, we're happy the way we are. It's perfect. Don't do anything. Just come to work and sit and rest and drink coffee all morning. Done. I can do that. It's super easy. But we need to grow because we've grown out of space. Because we don't have any place for our youth. We don't have any place for our middle school. We don't have 
have enough space to come together and drink coffee after big events. And so we need the space, but we're going to be the ones to create it. We're not going to wait for somebody else to come to teach us. And if we don't like the direction of our church, if we feel like the ministries aren't what they could be, then we change it. I saw an uh, uncle take his niece and nephew out on vacation. And he was the fun uncle. He kind of ruined some kids. He was all the junk food and drops back off the house. He said the only goal of the vacation was if they weren't having fun, then they would stop and do something else. And that's how it is in St. Thomas. If we don't like the ministry we're running, then we stop and we do different ministry. If we feel like there's ways to grow our outreach, then we stop and we grow our outreach. Not what Josiah will do for you, but what we do together, because you are the royal priesthood of God. You are the ones that create the church. You are not just parishioners who are pillars, that we cannot exist without you, and we are not without you. But I think that doesn't just make us a better church. It doesn't make us just a more vital and alive church. It makes us a safer church. It makes us a safer church. So we say it's not what Josiah does in the mystery back room off to himself. It's what we do all together in the light of death. It's we create an atmosphere and space where God's work is done together in a way that's safe for our future generations. That we raise people up and we love them. We take care of them. And we protect and we create the church of God. We are the very people.